So it's not every conference that I go to where being the lunchtime speaker and talking about cow poop is an obvious tie-in. And so here it feels like the most natural setting ever. But other places I have to do a disclaimer about the fact that they're eating lunch and I'm about to talk to you about cow poop. So as was mentioned, we have a dairy farm. And I, for the animal agriculture folks in the room, you know that means a lot of poop. But how much poop? about 100 pounds per animal. And so it is an incredible resource, right? Like we have reframed how we think about it. It's not a pollutant, it is a resource as long as we handle it correctly. So on our farm, that manure is used as fertilizer to grow our crops, as bedding for our cows, and we actually have the longest continuously running methane digester in the country. We have been capturing that methane and heating our house with it since 1997. But we still have an abundance of what comes through the other side of the digester. So we had to get creative about how to handle it. So I'm going to play this little video, hopefully. Plastic is always perfect looking because you can't break it and it doesn't break down, but it's not perfect when it's piled up in a heap in the back of your greenhouse. It is absolutely critical to our long-term viability to have alternatives to single-use plastic. We started cow pots in 1997. The cow actually produces the feedstock and then she produces the energy to go ahead and make the product. You can just see little pieces of the pot are still attached, but it's definitely basically broken down. So in less than three months, the cow pot is completely degraded. When you put this pot in the ground, you're adding value to the soil. So you got to see my mom, my dad, like this is like family. I get to leave the farm occasionally to come to an event like this, get some space away from mom and dad. Um, so usually I'm speaking and engaging with growers and I know this is a mixed audience so I just wanted to do some high level kind of like bullet points about what we do and what our product does and so when if you do any growing and tis the season like this is when you should be starting your sugar snap peas your spinach your lettuce um, but the benefits of our product is that the roots grow right through the pot wall you never end up with a root bound plant and when it's time to transplant the whole thing goes in the ground so there's nothing to throw away We've designed our manufacturing process to be zero waste. The only thing that exits the building is water vapor when we're drying our product and finished product. And as you can see in that picture of my dad and the skid steer, those are pots that didn't meet our quality standards. And guess what? They're going to be recycled and used as cow bedding. So there's literally nothing that leaves that building that's not useful. Um, and so I know that there's quite a few municipalities um, and people that work in their town government in the room, and so I just wanted to highlight the fact that we love working with schools and community groups. Like, nothing gives me greater pleasure than engaging with third graders on this being a product that's recycled and renewable, um, and so there's always exciting opportunities to engage with schools and community groups. Um, but also the fact that we're working with growers at scale, that we have a biodegradable pot that is designed to serve a real purpose at scale in commercial production that is reducing the need for plastic. And so you'll see me, if you haven't already, just outside this room on the right. Um, I have a lot of pots. I don't want to take any of this crap home with me. So <laughs> please stop by and, and grab a sample. And um, just, you know, pulling your attention to the USDA bio-based um, bio product and the fact that there are, just like our earlier speaker mentioned today, like there's a lot of look-alikes, right? So you can put a lot of compostable pots in the ground, but that doesn't mean that they're going to break down. And so the fact that we are committed to a pot that is going to biodegrade in the same growing season that you plant it. And so one last little video clip to share with you because one highlight that I find when I go out with cow pots is that most people like to stick it up to their nose and smell it. So this is the finest, the finest way that I can articulate kind of speaking to that point. Um, but Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs came and did an episode on our farm in 2007. And so this is probably my favorite video clip of all time. Doesn't even stink a little. Doesn't even stink a little. 
That's, that's, that's amazing. So somebody home could put their uh, petunias in it and then plant the whole thing out in the garden. Plant it out in the garden and it disappears. And it adds nutrients to your soils. Makes the plant grow bigger, faster, stronger. But the reason it's a cow pot? Why? Is cow gives us everything. She gives us the feedstock, she gives us the energy, and the incentive to go forward and do this. You love the cow, don't you? Love the cow. I love the cow, too. Got to give her credit. You really do. Here's to the cow. This pot's for you. So that episode has played in 125 countries. And to this day, there's reruns. And I will see a spike to visits on my website when that episode has played. Like, even to this day. It's amazing. Um, and that didn't cost us a dime, just the day. And my father had so much more hair and was thinner back then. It's so cute. Um, anyways, so um, I would love to engage with you, connect with you, send my crap home with you. Um, and so that's my contact information on the screen. I'll be right outside. And I really genuinely appreciate you and the whole crew that put this day together. What an important topic to spend t like intentional time talking about and networking about. Thank you. All yes. right. Yes, tell me. Our main speaker today for lunch is Dr. Sally Brown. She's the research associate professor, University of Washington at Seattle, and she is in Seattle today. Dr. Brown is an award-winning research professor and science writer whose work focuses on soil health, climate change mitigation, organics recycling, and wastewater treatment. At the root of her work, she believes that soil amendments in the form of residual from different industries, compost, for example, offer the potential to help us to live in a more sustainable manner. All right. Sally, are you ready? I am. And let me share my screen here. So you guys are not being allowed to have a peaceful lunch here. And first you, I think, got to see pictures of cows and their feces, and now you get rotten food to accompany your lunch. Can you guys hear okay? Yes. I'm gonna take that as a yes? Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, this is to make you feel good. Um, EPA just released a new version of their waste reduction model and compost shines in this model. Um, U.S. Compost Council is just submitted the last round of comments here. One of the big things with this new warm model um, is it, it uses a, a new report on landfill methane emissions. And the new report is not based on any new data per se, but it does take a lot of old data and finally put it together in one big piece. And Surprise, surprise, you put it together, you take wet, smelly stuff with a lot of nutrients, put it and squish it in a landfill, and it starts emitting methane long before methane capture systems go into place. And here you can see a picture. This is Nora Goldstein, publisher of BioCycle's very own food waste. This is celebrity food waste, um, and a link to a column I wrote in BioCycle on this. Um, here is a graphic from the EPA report, basically that wasted food is responsible for 58% of the methane emissions from landfills. That's a lot. And it's a very easy thing in principle to take that methane emission, take that landfill out of, blah, 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 take that food scraps out of the landfill and just quick D, low tech, low hanging fruit, way to solve, take away these methane emissions. Um, food scraps are so perfect for methane emissions and you're finishing your lunch now, take a look down at your plates, um, see what scraps you have left. Likely you don't, hopefully um, with the caterer, you don't have any mold, but if you look at the back of your refrigerator or you look at your food scrap bin, I would imagine you'll see some pretty colors and interesting growth. Um, Food scraps are generally nice and wet, um, nutrient rich, and 
you know when they start stinking that that's anaerobic conditions. So very quickly, they start composing and making methane. Um, right now, and this is using data that's well over 25 years old, um, the EPA model puts it about a one-to-one -one balance between food waste in and CO2 equivalent out. That's a lot. Um, and that is from data in one lab study using one kind of food scraps, and the person that generated those food scraps didn't eat enough fruit and vegetables. So with a proper diet, you would get even more methane equivalent. So another factor to consider is now um, the EPA data used estimates um, of landfill gas emissions. There are now drones that can go measure methane over um, sources in real time. A uh, study out of California, California's methane super emitters, you can see the, the red dots here in these colors, this is a landfill. And landfills were second only to gas facilities for landfill emissions. Very, very high. And this is real time proof that this is not something that people are saying, this is something that can be measured. Um, so Connecticut is one of five states where landfill, um, putting food scraps in a landfill has at least on paper been prohibited. And I'd say you guys are in an elite group here and you should pat yourselves on the back, um, feel pretty good about this. Um, California, um, Vermont, Maine, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Um, you, it, it's fabulous. You, this is a great thing. Um, and one way to feel good about this is a whole series I did on the benefits of compost, taking it, taking food scraps out of landfills and then making the compost. Um, and what's fabulous about it is not only do you stop the methane, you make the world a better place. And that comes from adding compost to soil. So what's happening now is in our world, you're starting to see the recognition that soil is important, that people like to eat and soil is pretty critical to that. Um, this sort of groundswelling pretty much started with the Marin Carbon Project. I don't know if you guys have heard of Marin Carbon. I would say raise your hand and I see a little image of the room, but I see one hand went up on Marin Carbon at least. Um, these guys took um, cow manure, composted it, added it to degraded rangelands, and saw, oh my God, compost makes a huge difference. And I would imagine this is not news to any of you in this room. And our last speaker, uh, same deal. And it's fabulous that this is now getting into the general population. Um, soil carbon sequestration is even better than stopping methane emissions because it's a big tool for both climate change, carbon storage, and soil health. And here you can see which field had the organic amendment. Is it the one that looks like the wheat is very sick and getting ready to not give you much bread or grain? Or is it this wheat over here? I, I think you know the answer. Um, regenerative agriculture, soil health, these are all new terms in our vocabulary, rel relatively new terms, long before, um, long, long after, rather, uh, our whole notion of composting yard waste came into being as an important thing to do. We're now understanding that you can't just put anhydrous ammonia on soil and call it good. Um, there's a Soil Health Institute, and soil health is the foundation for regenerative agriculture. Study after study basically says to get soil health, you need to increase soil organic matter. Soil is now sexy. Um, maybe not Sydney Sweeney kind of sexy, um, more of a save the planet kind of sexy. And just to show you how old I am, um, I had to ask my son for somebody that was under 50 and considered to be a sex symbol because my day it was Farrah Fawcett. Um, some of you may remember Farrah Fawcett. They're supposed to laugh at this. I 
thankfully can't hear if you got the joke or not, but I'll move on. Um, you have all these tech startups, these, these 20 year olds saying, we got to fix soil. Here's an example, Teradot. This Stanford junior won the 2021 Congressional Medal for Food Recovery and now has started a very heavily financed um, company to restore the soil through adding carbon to the soil. You have movies on soil. Kiss the Ground with Woody Har Harrelson was a couple of years ago. Um, the solution is right under our feet and Wolfgang Puck is quoted. Now they have a new one, Common Ground. So you can watch movies about soil. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen any of these. Um, some states are also starting to put into legislation soil health initiatives. Um, Washington State, where I live, is one of these. And um, Washington Soil Health, if you um, read in the yellow, one of the goals of the soil health legislation is to overcome existing barriers to increasing organic inputs, compost, manure, biosolids, and biochar. That's pretty neat that it's, it's going into state legislation. And why compost here? Well, no-till, we used to think, was a great tool to make soils healthier. Um, and, and it's certainly better than conventional tillage. It had been the big answer for large-scale agriculture. A lot of studies have shown the benefits, but they've also started to show that the benefits are limited to the top few inches of soil, and that those benefits come at the expense of lower soil depths where you see decreases in soil carbon. Cover crops, another great solution. Um, crimson clover looks beautiful and, and helps soil, um, increases soil carbon, but a study out of California just showed, just like no-till, it gives you carbon on top, but it steals it from the bottom. And the one case where that wasn't true in this California study was in the case where poultry manure compost was used in addition to cover crops. And there, where the cover crops ended up losing about 14 tons of CO2 per hectare over the years of the study, the cover crop plus poultry manure gave you 22 tons of CO2 equivalent. That's phenomenal. That soil health and that was a corn tomato rotation. You do this rotation, you get plenty of cherry tomatoes, more than you can ever eat. So what you're seeing, not just in this study from California, but across the board, is what's called exogenous organic matter, compost or, or organics from away from the farm. Um, adding those back to the soil is a proven way to get soil carbon increased and soil health without robbing from the bottom of your soil depth. Here's an example of one study um, that was looking at a range of long-term field sites in Europe. Um, how much of the added fraction of carbon stays put, biosolids 66%, green waste compost 100%, MSW compost 82%. Some of that is the carbon that you've added. Some of that is how much growth you see as a result of adding the compost. And this is aerial image from a field study in, in Eastern Washington where biosolids are used for dry land wheat and you can see the difference in green and that tells you the story. Um, my own work um, done with uh, grad student Kate Kurtz who now does a lot of compost programs for city of Seattle. We looked at compost and biosolids and turf grass, landscape, orchards, dryland wheat, roadside use, and in all of these cases, we saw big increases in soil carbon sequestration, how much nitrogen was in the soil, and how much water that soil could hold on to, making it a drought resistance tool, um, the best tool we have. So soil is sexy. Not only with compost do you get methane avoidance, you get beautiful soil, um, and here it's this is from a column I wrote, how much more effective um, these exogenous organic matter, including compost is in comparison to cover crops, many times more effective. 
So you're doing great things for soil. And even the USDA, not even the USDA, the USDA is starting to recognize this. There's a soil carbon amendment program now that's just starting in different states, um, code 336, and it pays farmers for using compost. Different amounts in different states, you have to do a basic soil test to qualify, but this in turn can subsidize sales of compost because it pays farmers to use compost, making it more affordable. Um, the US model that we use for carbon sequestration um, is the Comet model. That's a focus on agronomic crops and cover crops and no-till. Right now, as of now, there's limited to no mention of compost or exogenous organic matter, um, except for California. And if you want to talk about a fantasy, wonderful state, um, Comet Planner for California, I'm not sure if this has been adopted and enacted yet, but they now have compost use in California for orchards or vineyards, crop, crop, crop land or grazing lands as accepted practices. You can plug in how much compost you should use and what kind of use you're getting, and they give you an estimated payment. So here in this case, for using eight tons an acre of compost on land, you should get per acre $1,200. Now, wouldn't that be an amazing thing to have a farmer have this much cash to buy your compost? That would be a wonderful thing. Um, so you should be feeling pretty good, right? I can't see if anybody is feeling good, but promise me somebody is nodding. Okay. You're, you're saving the world from fugitive methane emissions, and you're saving the world through making the soil better. Um, but I got to tell you, Connecticut is sounding really good, but it's not perfect, and you got some work to do, so I'm going to burst your bubble here. Um, so I live in Seattle, and we've had food waste diversion for 15, 16 years, and we're considered a very successful program. I just did a study, and we looked at how much of the food waste generated actually ends up in the green bin. And while there's very high participation in single family homes where about half the people live, a um, little less than half of the potential material that could go in that green bin actually does. And if you go to multifamily where the other half of the city live, only about 12% of what could go in the green bin actually does. So how much of the food waste generated in Connecticut is actually ending up in the right place. It's one thing to have a law on the books. It's another thing to have people actually participate and take part in that and do that diversion. Another thing that I'm sure you're facing is the issue of contamination. Um, a recent report said that about 50, 20% uh, of costs for composting are contaminant removal, getting plastic, glass, other crap out of the compost so you end up with a saleable product. This is a huge headache and a huge issue to overcome. So you got to get people to actually do what they're supposed to do and not put in the plastic bag in the process. Um, one thing that could make this easier, um, I've done work with mill.com. There are a couple of other appliances newly released out there. They give ownership and make it easy to divert food scraps. They take uh, food scraps, you put them in this pretty looking machine, it quietly and in the evening turns it into dry material that um, shows little food um, produce stickers floating to the surface. So very much decreased contamination, decreased putrescibility, decreased yuck factor, maybe these kind of appliances will increase participation and decrease contamination and make your job easier. The other thing, and this to me is a, a big passion of mine, is the elephant in the room. Um, biosolids, and I do a lot of work with biosolids, are richer in nutrients, more consistent, and lower in contaminants than food scraps. And just 
while you may say, but I was, ah, PFAS, boot scraps have PFAS too. You can see here a picture of Toby in front of the plot with fertilizer and Toby in front of the plot with a uh, biosolids based soil product. This is some good stuff. Um, in Connecticut, um, you burn just about all the biosolids that are generated. And the carbon equivalent for burning those materials, and this is from um, uh, a calculator model that I developed with Ned Beecher and Andrew Carpenter, both Northeast guys. Um, your CO2E um, is very, very high, 125,000 metric tons for um, biosolids incinerated and another 30,000 tons for um, biosolids landfilled. So if you take that amount of greenhouse gas emissions from burning the biosolids, and you compare them um, to how much you would get if all of the food scraps in Connecticut were captured and bought to composting, even if you score 100% on food scrap diversion, you're still coming out neutral because you're burning the biosolids. So um, you better hurry up and finish lunch because you, you guys are doing great things, but you got a lot of work ahead of you. A um, lot, lot of organics left to put in that windrow, and that's what I have. <laughs>